So, over the past couple weeks, I have been reading Reductionism in Art and Brain Science by Eric Kandel, um, kind of a big name in the field of neuroscience, but I really enjoyed this book. I think one of its main goals was to look at the interplay between art and neuroscience, uh, specifically abstract art and neuroscience. I think as an artist myself, I'm a watercolor painter. Most of my work isn't very abstract, but you know, after reading this book, I might dip my toe in a little bit more. I think there's a, a strong divide between, you know, artists and scientists. And Kendall discusses this in the beginning of the book. The idea that both of these are separate fields that don't really overlap is a bit limiting. In the introduction, Kendall talks about how science is concerned with the physical nature of the universe, whereas art is concerned with the nature of human experience, which I thought was really interesting. And especially with regards to neuroscience, because what is neuroscience if not studying the human experience, especially when you get into cognitive neuroscience. So I thought this book was a really interesting kind of foray between those two fields and how they influence each other, specifically through the lens of reductionism, which gets a bit of a bad rap, but I think the way Kendall uses it here is really interesting. So at the beginning, he defines reductionism to mean focusing on one or a couple parts of a subject, not the whole subject, um, and seeing how those parts interact and how, I guess, reducing a subject or a concept to one or a few things can really bring out new insights. And he talks about how this is done pretty thoroughly in both art and science, which is true in my experience as both a scientist and an artist, um, but it was really interesting to see how that kind of evolves uh, throughout the course of the book as we look at a bunch of artists, you know, as is thought of generally in science involving the scientific method, you look at something and you break it down into its constituent parts and study their respective bits and then put it back together and see how they interact. This is really the case in neuroscience, which is such a wide and interdisciplinary field. But when you're studying the brain, a lot of the big achievements and uh, shifts in understanding about the brain have been done because we reduced the complicated problem of, say, visual perception, which is talked about a lot in this book, to something very small and reduced. And then that gave us a better idea of how that process worked. For example, something that's talked about in this book and just in general neuroscience is that there are cells in the visual cortex that respond specifically to uh, lines of certain orientations and directions. Um, and then as processing goes further on into more advanced stages of the visual pathway, these lines at certain orientations can combine to form boundaries or shapes. The precise way that's done is not super clearly defined, but that is something where looking at a really reduced uh, version of the problem helps us kind of understand how it can be put together and give us a greater understanding. Uh, other examples in neuroscience include how there are, you know, parallel streams of processing for different information. You know, we know that color is processed in like a certain area and by a certain set of um, pathways, whereas movement is processed separately. And this is, I would say, a form of reductionism where even though, you know, when we visually experience the world, we experience all of these things together. We experience color, we experience motion, we experience shape in the processing system. They are reduced and they are done kind of separately and then they at a higher level interplay together to give us our visual experience. Another example of you know, parallel processing in the brain is the difference between the dorsal and the ventral streams. These are two parallel streams of processing of visual information in the brain that both start near the back of the brain at the occipital lobe at the primary visual cortex. The dorsal stream kind of travels along the top of the head in a dorsal sense towards the parietal lobe and that is where a lot of spatial information and movement and knowledge of where visual things are in space is processed. 
And at a parallel time, you have the ventral stream, which kind of goes around the side of the head near the temporal lobes. And that looks at how you can identify objects and uh, kind of remembering what things are and identifying them and putting names and labels to things. So these are two different streams of processing where different things are being processed at the same time. So just one more way of visual processing that this book talks about is bottom-up versus top-down processing. You know, bottom-up processing is basically taking the raw sensory data of lights and darks and edges and boundaries and color data from like wavelength and then putting them together in the brain to give a sense of what our environment is and what we're perceiving. That's bottom-up. You're going from the bottom of the raw sensory data up to the kind of visual imagination of the world we have. Bottom-up processing is interesting because, you know, the world we live in is 3D, but the image at the back of our retinas when we get light back there is 2D. So our brain has to develop all these shortcuts and tools and computations to give us an understanding of our 3D environment from a set of 2D data. So the idea is that there are inherent ambiguities in that data and our brain has to make calls on what we're actually perceiving because we can't know everything about our environment because it's, you know, 3D and we don't have all the information available from bottom-up processing. This is where top-down processing comes in. Top-down processing is higher areas of cognition like memory and learned associations and emotions that influence our perception. There are many cases when, you know, remembering something a certain way or having a certain emotion associated with something can affect how you perceive something. And that is what kind of top-down processing does. So when you have learned associations, when you have memories of how the world is supposed to be, like, you know that generally the sun is above you. So if something is, you know, lighter at its top than its bottom then it's oriented a certain way and this is like a learned association and this comes from top-down processing where you know your experience of the world your emotions your higher cognitive things can affect how you perceive something and those are you know two parallel ways of processing that work together to give you a sense of the visual world so like I said, those are kind of examples of how reductionism is used in neuroscience generally, specifically with ties to visual perception. The other kind of half of this book is how reductionism is used in art, specifically in abstract art. You know, the book draws like this boundary between figurative art and abstract art. Figurative arts as in like landscapes and portraits and still lives and things that, you know, have representational images in them of things in the real world. That's what the book calls figurative art versus, you know, abstract art, which is a lot easier to see when you see it in the sense that, oh, that that is abstract art. We've all seen some modern art or like a single line on a page and thought, yep, that's abstract art. And, you know, even as an artist, there are times in my artistic kind of study where I think like, that you can't call that art. That's just, you know, something abstract. And I don't know, this book kind of really changed my perspective on that. Um, so with regards to reductionism, there's this idea in the book presented about how for most of uh, artistic history up till like the 20th century, basically, almost all art and almost all high art was very figurative in the sense that it depicted things in the real world. We, you know, with the advent of photography and like a lot of, you know, changes in culture at that time, artists started seeking more radical expressions of art that weren't figurative anymore. The book goes into a bunch of different artists and how they specifically reduced, you know, figuration and figurative art into one of its key constituent elements. So there are examples of many artists, starting with, you know, J.M.W. Turner, who was very early. The book talks about how he was one of the first artists to kind of depart from figurative things. But even the artists that we know of, like uh, Jeff Koons, Kandinsky, Jackson Pollock, all of these artists started in a more figurative sense. And then as their careers progressed, they got more 
abstract because they were reducing things. One of my favorite artists that I've kind of learned from this book is Piet Mondrian, who who did the famous painting Broadway Boogie Woogie. It looks like a bunch of squares of primary colors and a bunch of grids and lines. Um, and, you know, I tried to show it to my brother, who's not super into art or anything, but I was excited about it. And he asked me what I was doing. And I showed him the painting I was looking at. And he was like, I don't get it. Why is it so special? And I don't know. I didn't realize that there was so much behind these works in the sense that what Mondrian was doing was reducing things down to line and color. So, you know, he refused to use non-primary colors at that point because, you know, the primary colors are what we think of as forming all the other colors. So he would only use these three colors and he would only use vertical lines, horizontal lines, squares. And he was really trying to reduce kind of, I guess, the idea of whatever he was trying to convey in these really simplified forms. And that I think is really interesting. Um, in another sense, Jackson Pollock, whose work involved a lot of action painting and like tripping and moving around the canvas and taking the canvas off the easel and putting it on the floor, which was unheard of, Pollock kind of reduced art to movement and I guess complexity. Like Mondrian's work and uh, Pollock's work are very different in the sense that one of them seems very simple and the other seems very complex and intricate, but both of them are reduced forms of art not in like a pejorative sense but in a sense that they're taking this idea of color or movement and reducing it down to something that is simpler to try and exemplify that aspect of the subject which I found very interesting. I also think one of the hardest artists to kind of I guess to kind of explain to other people is Mark Rothko who did a lot of work that was just like giant blocks of color. These were giant canvases. I even think he had one exhibit that was talked about in this book that was a chapel of just paintings of black squares, which is so hard to kind of justify. Like, why is this a valid mode of art? But a lot of people have re have reported going to see Rothko's work and coming away with some sort of almost spiritual, just like deep psychological experience where they talk about how the work how these giant blocks of color or these giant blocks of black um, have hidden depths and speak to them in terms of, you know, just the act of looking at these blocks of colors and looking at the, even like within these blocks of color, the intricacy of the layering of the paint and like different things showing through the canvas. As you look at these works, they give people like a sense of, I don't know, some sort of spiritual feeling. I don't think I've seen a Rothko in person, but I would really like to after having read this book. I think, again, with Rothko, what he was doing, he did away with line, he did away with form, he did away with everything. He was only looking at pure color and seeing how that could influence visual perception. And I thought that was really interesting. So the book goes into a lot of different artists and talked about how they kind of reduced figurative art into something more specific and smaller and more focused and then looked at how that experience kind of informs how we view art and I thought that was a very compelling narrative and I really enjoyed looking at all these different artists and their types of work so after this book goes into all of these artists and their contributions to the movement I found something really interesting is kind of how uh, neuroscience and abstract art and art in general are, you know, two sides of the same coin. One of the ideas I really liked was that visual perception is a creative process. And I mean a creative process in two senses. You know, there's the literal sense where you have ambiguities in the world and, you know, you're having the bottom up info of that raw sensory data and there are ambiguities in that. And then you have to use the top down processing of your learned associations and your memories and emotions to make sense of what your visual perception is. And that's a creative process in that your perception is something created from this data in the most literal sense. But, you know, in the other sense, we know what creativity means in the artistic sense. There is inherent creativity and artistic creativity, I would say, in visual perception. And that kind of, you know, ties both 
neuroscience and art together. Another thing that I found really interesting is that the process of creating figurative art involves some of the same computations that our brain does when it comes to bottom-up processing. You know, like we said, there's a 2D image on the retina, but you want to give a 3D version of the world. If you look at any of the old Renaissance paintings that involve perspective or, you know, overlap of uh, different things in the background, or, you know, when things get blurry, when they're further away, and like, you know, changes in texture with distance, all of these things that you do in figurative paintings of portraits and landscapes, these are kind of similar to the bottom-up processes and the heuristics that the brain has to do to make calls about what the visual environment is. So figurative art relies a lot on the same type of bottom-up processing our brain does. On the flip side, abstract art does none of this. Like the most abstract art has so much inherent ambiguity to it that we can't really use bottom-up processing. We don't see any landscapes or faces or anything in these paintings, so we can't really rely on our bottom-up processing and our heuristics as much. We have to solely rely on top-down processing. We have to rely on what our memories and our emotions and our thoughts tell us about the work. You know, there are quotes in the book about how, like, it's not lazy. We have to actually have a cognitive, a higher cognitive idea of what this art means, and that's why abstract art, in a sense, is, I guess, harder to penetrate to the greater public. I don't know if I fully agree with that. I think there's a lot to be said for uh, abstract art that, you know, the public really likes. But I think it's really interesting, this like dichotomy between figurative art and abstract art in the sense that one of them is like more reliant on your top down processing and the other is more reliant on your bottom up processing. Actually, one of the stories I found really interesting was the kind of connection between art and music. So there's this kind of legend or myth that Kandinsky, a really prominent abstract artist, couldn't fully break from figurative work because he, like many of these artists, started in a more figurative sense. He couldn't fully break from that until he heard Schoenberg's music. And, you know, Schoenberg was a composer who kind of broke more from the traditional sense of music of the time in the sense that he was atonal, which was pretty new. And I thought that was really interesting in that for Kandinsky, hearing this kind of break from traditional music was the impetus or something that inspired him to go fully abstract with his art. You know, one of the things I found interesting in the book was the kind of notion that musicians don't really make music that sounds like the outside environment. You know, there's some music that is like that, but most music kind of it's not trying to depict the natural world. So there's the idea, why should art be trying to do that? Uh, why can't art be as detached and like free form from the natural world as music? And that was one of the ideas that spurred the abstract movement. One more thing to kind of relate this to the general concept of arts and not just visual arts is the idea of poetry. And you know, there are there is a lot of poetry out there that's pretty reductionist in the sense that it takes these complex ideas um, and feelings and reduces them into a few words. And because there's nothing else there to kind of explain to us how to feel about these words, we have to use our own learned associations, our own memories and emotions to interpret it. And that kind of, I feel like that has a clear tie into abstract art. You know, both of them are involving, I guess, these top-down processes in our brain. And that kind of sheds light on whatever emotions or feelings or anything that there is because it's so reduced and you're focused and you have to focus on it. I think the most interesting chapters of the book are the ones that kind of discuss how the brain responds to abstract art because, you know, our brain and our heuristics and our computation wasn't really meant to respond to a Rothko piece or a Pollock painting or something like that. It was meant to respond to the landscapes and faces and portraits of objects. Like evolutionarily, that's what our brain is good at detecting. But the abstract work kind of turns that on its head and makes us look at things that we don't usually look at either from like a personal sense that you don't usually see these things in your life, but from an evolutionary sense in that the human brain wasn't really built to look at stuff like this. So it kind of creates a different feeling in our brain. And we have to create new associations and come up with meanings for this work. 
that doesn't have an immediate figurative representational meaning right off the bat. As someone who studies quite a bit of neuroscience, I was a little bit disappointed that there weren't as many references to fMRI studies or just brain imaging data in general about the brain's responses to art. One of the ones that there was a reference to, though, was the study that abstract art activates a bunch of regions in the brain, ones that respond to all areas of art, not just things that are category specific, like figurative art of or like portraiture, you know, strongly activates the fusiform face area, you know, landscapes and like interiors, you know, activate areas that involve places. But, you know, abstract art isn't category specific. It kind of breaks that mold and activates a lot of different areas of the brain when compared to figurative art. It's kind of interesting that like abstract art, the brain recognizes did not really fit into one category. Another interesting one was looking at eye tracking experiments, you know, in figurative art of portraits and landscapes, we tend to focus on salient features and things that, you know, representationally we can understand and interpret what they are. Whereas in abstract art, the eyes move around the entire piece. Um, And I've definitely had the personal experience of like looking at, you know, a Pollock painting or something and like moving my gaze around, like trying to figure out what I'm looking at and if there's anything there. And that is just something that, again, sets apart abstract art from figurative art. Another thing that I found interesting was the idea that since abstract art, you know, doesn't really fit into any one category in the brain and there isn't anything representational in there for us to lock onto, our brain is free to make its own associations and use whatever um, high-level cognitive processing to relate our memories or our emotions or our thoughts to this abstract work. And there's the idea that our brain finds this rewarding, in a sense. It's very briefly touched upon in the book, but it got me thinking I would really like to see studies on the reward pathway or um, the dopaminergic systems in the brain or anything to see if, you know, looking at abstract art, making these freewheeling connections is rewarding in a sense. And I think that would be really interesting. And maybe it's not rewarding for everyone. Maybe only certain people like abstract art. But I would love to see if there's some kind of sense of reward and how that ties into our experience of art. You know, that kind of goes into aesthetics. Like, what do we find beautiful? What do we find, you know, good art? I would like to see if this idea of allowing our brain to make associations is really something rewarding. Continuing on, you know, one artist that the book highlighted that I found really interesting was Fred Sandback. The piece that they talked about was this kind of sculptural thing where he took black yarn and made kind of a prism outline with it, where it looks like the yarn is like outlining a 3D space. There's nothing inside it, but if you look at it, it looks like a block of something. It looks like there is volume there, even though there isn't. It's just outlined in yarn. And I found that really interesting because he is looking at how our visual system kind of alters what there is in the environment because there's nothing in the volume. It just is a suggestion of a volume and our brain fills it in for us. You know, there are lots of optical illusions that do stuff like that, but I found that one super telling that the brain cares about this fake volume that's inside the yarn more than it cares about the actual sculpture, which is made out of yarn. It's just this other reminder that, you know, interpreting art and looking at the environment is a creative process. We're generating something. One more thing I found really interesting, you know, as someone who studies neuroscience, is this tie-in with the default mode network. The book calls it the default network, but I've always studied it as the default mode network. This is a network of structures in the brain that are activated at rest, um, but suppressed when dealing with things in the outside world. So when you're daydreaming, when you're listening to music, when you're recalling memories, when you're introspecting, you know, thinking about yourself, Something that isn't involving any particular task in the outside world, the default mode network is active. So structures in this network are the medial temporal lobe, which deals with memory, the posterior cingulate cortex, which kind of evaluates sensory information, and the medial prefrontal cortex, which is associated, as the book says, with a theory of mind. So this network is kind of about introspection and kind of, you know, thinking about yourself in that regard. I found it interesting that they've done studies where they looked at activation in the default mode network during people 
experiencing visual art and they would ask people to rate this art on a scale of one to four from least to most pleasing and the default mode network is activated only in fours when people find the artwork the most pleasing. I thought that was really neat and the idea that art that activates the default mode network is art that kind of relates to our sense of self. Uh, a lot of figurative paintings really do this, which makes sense because, you know, when you can recognize something in a painting, you can tie it to yourself better. So a lot of figurative work does activate the default mode network. I would find it really interesting to look at which abstract paintings activate the default mode network and if that is uh, inherent to the certain abstract paintings. Like if I showed a bunch of people a particular Rothko work, would they all have their default mode network activated or is it individualized to the person? I would guess that it's the latter, but it would be really cool to see if there are studies that do that. So that is mainly all I really had to say about the main chunk of this book. I thought it was really interesting, gave me a new appreciation for abstract art, and, you know, kind of confirmed some of the thoughts I had about how art and neuroscience are very intertwined. I've always thought that, but it's been hard to kind of articulate why I thought that these two were kind of sides of the same coin and this book really helped. I did have some qualms about this book. Uh, like I said before, I thought I wish it referenced more neural studies, but you know that that's not that big of a deal. Uh, one of the things I do think was really telling in this book was the lack of representation of women artists. Um, you know, there was this like focus on Western art and Western abstract expressionism as the driving chunk of the text and I was willing to overlook that because it was about abstract art and I knew what I was getting into but one of the things I really was disappointed by was the lack of women in this book um there are women artists who do abstract work you know Helen Frankenthaler is a color field painter is one of them Georgia O'Keeffe's work has been over time pretty abstract and these were you know vaguely referenced in the book but not super gone into. An example I can give is when the book was talking about de Kooning's work. Willem de Kooning uh, painted a lot of abstract work dealing with women, and at one point the book said de Kooning gave birth to a new synthesis of the female. And you know, I don't know, that kind of rubbed me the wrong way, because why is there such a focus on how male artists synthesize females? Like, for most of art history, the female form and the female gaze was dictated by how men saw women. And I think, especially for a movement that is supposed to break from the traditional norms of art, I think it was a bit of an oversight to overlook how women kind of define womanhood and femininity through abstract art. Another example I can give is a short discussion on Gustav Klimt's work, Judith, which is a beautiful, seductive, like, portrait of Judith holding the head of Holofernes, a uh, uh, general she beheaded. And I, the book kind of celebrates it as, you know, uh, a woman experiencing rage and sexual emotion and being like a sexual being looking directly at the viewer. Um, and I think that's valuable to, in a sense, but also like she is still being thought of as beautiful and sexualized by a male painter. And I think, you know, that is common in art, but I think only looking at that doesn't give a full sense of, you know, women in the role of art. A personal painting that I really love is Artemisia Gentileschi's portrait of the same scene. It's called Judith Beheading Holofernes. It is one of my favorite paintings. It's, it's a Renaissance era painting, or maybe it's Baroque, I don't remember, but it is this beautiful, you know, dark depiction of Judith and one of her maids beheading Holofernes, and it is not sexualized. It is very raw. And, you know, I saw this painting in Italy, and I just, like, sat in front of it for, like, 20 minutes just looking at it because it's so different from, you know, other portrayals of the same event that, you know, feminize or, like, eroticize that event. And I don't know, this is kind of unrelated to this book at all, but... I think it's, you know, I think in art and in neuroscience, there is a lack of, you know, listening to or looking at women's paintings. So I thought, although I love this book and it, you know, really gave me a sense of the abstract movement, I thought the lack of 
uh, emphasis on or focus on or even really mention of female artists was something that was notable and could have been done better. You know, like I said, other than that, I really enjoyed this book because it gave me, um, I don't know, it felt like a source that I could point to to say, see, science and art really are related. You know, I have always kind of been an advocate of that and an advocate of how, you know, the same ideas of reductionism and analysis and um, creation of models and science can be applied in art and how creativity and ingenuity can be applied in science. And I really appreciated this book kind of melding those two for me. You know, like I said at the beginning, most of my work is figurative with a little bit of ties into abstract art every now and then. Generally, I draw most of my experience from the Impressionists, whose work I find really illuminating because of their influence of light and color and scene. So I generally all of my work is figurative. However, in the spirit of this book, I did dip my toe into some abstract work, which I have linked somewhere in the description of this podcast. I don't think it's groundbreaking or like on par with any of the artists talked about in this book, especially because this is kind of my first foray into abstract art. But I really enjoyed the process and I really enjoyed the idea of, you know, art that doesn't really represent anything um, on its surface, but you can kind of make your own top down associations with what you think they mean. You know, I have certain ideas of what these pieces look like and what they speak to me, but I don't think I'm going to share them because I would like people to draw their own top down associations about what my pieces mean. I made three of them, um, and I think what is really interesting about them is their texture, their colors, and kind of the sense of movement in them. Um, but I think I'll leave it at that in terms of what I think these pieces mean. But in any case, I will definitely be looking more into abstract art and incorporating some reductionist principles into my own art to see if I can kind of look at things from a new perspective and see if I can elicit new perceptual responses from them. So overall, yeah, I do recommend this book, even if you're not very well versed in art history or in neuroscience. I think it does a good job of kind of bringing everyone along with it for what the author is talking about. And even if you are pretty well versed in either or both of those fields, I think it's it would be a good book to read to see the connection and see how they interplay with each other, which I think was the goal of this book, which is to look at reductionism in both of these fields and how they relate to each other. And I think it really did accomplish that goal.